So those of you who have been following us this summer realize that we've been in the midst of a sermon series uh, that we've called Hot Dogma of Faith, where we are answering questions that the congregation has about faith. And we are doing this from the perspective, our answers are coming from the perspective of our denomination, of Presbyterian, you know, how do Presbyterians look at these issues of faith? Because each denomination kind of looks at issues of faith from a different, from differing perspectives. So our question this week that came from you all is, why is a person with faith afraid to die? So that's the question. And I think all of us can, in one way or another, perhaps understand a little bit of what, where that question comes from, but also why someone might be afraid to die. I mean, you just look around this park, and the world is a beautiful place. And then when you add the relationships that we have with one another, it adds to the depth of the beauty of this world. And this world, we understand that God gave, it, that Jesus came, that God gave us this world so that we could have abundant life, Scripture tells us. So, of course, this life is the thing we know. It's the thing we have, the thing that we are familiar with. But we also have this thing that we call faith. So what do we as Presbyterians believe? Well, this is a great time to look at our confessions. And our confessions tell us, if we look at the Heidelberg Confession, it says, that, so in the Heidelberg Confession, it's, it's um, laid out as a series of questions and answers. And the first question in the Heidelberg Confession is, what is your comfort in life and in death? And the answer to that question is that I may belong body and soul in life and in death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Now that confession, admittedly, was written hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Do we still believe that? Well, our denomination more recently wrote a brief statement of faith. And in that brief, brief statement of faith, it actually starts with, in life and in death, we, no longer I, but we, belong to God. And if we held on to that belief that we belong to, to God no matter what, maybe death wouldn't be so frightening. But unfortunately, we don't live in a theological vacuum. And so we hear about the beliefs of all sorts of systems around us. Um, I was raised in the Catholic Church, you all know that. And in the Catholic Church, if you die with sin on your soul, you're not going to the kingdom of God. You might, if you're lucky, go to purgatory, and your remaining friends and family on earth could pray you into heaven but what if you're older and you don't have many friends around? And what if your kids don't practice that same faith? How will you get into heaven if there's nobody to pray you there? Because unless you went to confession moments before you died, you will die with sin on your soul. So there's some issues there in our Catholic tradition. There are other traditions that say that you've got to be saved, that there's a right way. Well, how do we know that we have actually followed that prescription of the right way to be saved? Was our born-again experience significant enough? Was it really the right experience? So there's a lot of questions out there when you look at the influences of other faith traditions. And those all impact our view on the world. And so it's hard to know. The other thing is that's hard to know 
is what actually happens after death. I mean, none of us have been there. We can't see it. So what are people of faith left with? Well, I invite you to remember back to last week. If you remember last week, we talked about baptism. And I used that illustration from The Lion King, where Rafiki reminds Simba that of who he is, of who he is. And that then in the story, Simba goes back and is sort of the hero of the story. And afterwards, uh, I was talking with someone, and they said, you know, when we remember who we are, that helps us to be the, the hero of our own story, at least here. Ultimately, God is the hero of our stories. Um, but here, we get to be the hero of our story. And that's true. But there's also something more. If you remember in that story of the Lion King, Simba doesn't remember all on his own. It takes other people. It takes Rafiki and Nala, other people in his life, to remind him of who we are. And you know what, folks? That's you. And you, and you, and you, and me, and you. We remind one another. I mean, this is one of the reasons why we need a community of faith. Because when we forget who we are and to whom we belong, the community of faith reminds us. We remind one another of what we believe, of what, in essence, we know through faith. And what we remind one another of is that the one that created us loves us, loves you, loves me in this world and the next. We remind one another of what we know in Jesus Christ. We know from Scripture, or Scripture tells us, that there is judgment. But we also know that in Jesus Christ, that judgment is redemptive, not destructive. We are redeemed. And we remind that of one another when we forget. Because we do forget. We also remind one another of that phrase that we've talked periodically with the kids about, and I know that you all know the response. We remind one another that God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. And that time that we remind one another of is not just the time that we know. It's not just this time that we understand here and now, that we look at our clocks and calendars, that passing of time. No. The God that we know that is good all the time is actually also good in that time beyond the time that we understand. We do that collectively. We do that together. So there's still this issue, though, is why might someone be afraid to die or perhaps reluctant to let go of this life and enter into the next? And so I want to share with you just a couple of images that might help put it into some perspective for you. Uh, first of all, we all know that none of us is, is all good or all bad. So I invite you to think for a moment back to your high school days. Most of us in high school probably did a few things that we're really pleased with. But we also probably did a few things that we might regret. We maybe made a few enemies. We maybe have a few people there that we let down that we didn't treat as well as perhaps we should have or could have. So imagine that you are in your car going, you're in the parking lot going to your reunion. 
you look good, you're pleased with how you look, because of course that's important to some of us. You're confident until you see somebody walking in that you maybe remember in that instance wronging in high school. How is that person going to treat you when you get in the door? When you walk in, is, it going, is that reunion going to be quite as comfortable as perhaps you thought? And now imagine that it's not a reunion you're walking into, but that you're walking into the kingdom of God, to that great banquet. And how is God going to treat you? Well, our life experience tells us that there really is no such thing as unconditional love. We haven't seen it in this world. Perhaps the closest thing we've come to is the love from dogs, which is absolutely unconditional, as I sit here and look at Shelley with hers, that love that doesn't ever seem to leave us when we have a pet. But human love, human love is conditional. Are you doing what I want you to do, what I, what I think you should do? Are you being who I want you to be? And if not, well, then I don't care for you. And in the divisive world we live today, if you're not in line with my way of thinking and looking at the world, then you are my enemy. And it's that divisiveness that it's so hard to imagine that that doesn't also exist in the kingdom of God. So there on the cusp of heaven, will you really be greeted by unconditional love? Our confessions tell us yes. Yes, you will. Because in life and in death, we belong to this God who loved us enough to gift us with life. Imagine again being on that threshold and Maybe not being intimidated by who you might find in heaven or the greeting that you might have, but imagine standing on that threshold and looking back and seeing your family and knowing that when you step across that threshold, you don't know when you will see them again or if it will be the same. A reluctancy to leave this life is not at all unimaginable. But perhaps it's because this life is all we know. I mean, in fact, we're like the water bugs. Have you heard the story about water bugs? They make their nest, their colony, in the mud of ponds. And imagine this colony of water bugs there. And they watch periodically as one of their friends goes up a stalk and disappears into what is their sky. Well, this colony of water bugs gets together and they say, you know what? When the next one of us goes up, we don't understand why they're doing it or where they're going, but when the next one of us goes up, which surely they will, let's make a pact that we will come back. Whoever goes will come back and tell everybody what is happening up there and why they leave. Because I'm sure they like us, so why would they go? And so they all agree that that's what they're going to do. And the leader one day, not long after that conversation, finds themselves walking up, crawling up this stalk and breaking through the surface of the water and falls onto a lily pad. It is so exhausted the water bug falls asleep. Well, while he's asleep, a change happens. And when this water bug wakes up, he realizes that he's different. He's got wings. Imagine that. And so he finds himself with these wings, and he starts to move, and he realizes that he can fly. And so he's experimenting with this flying all over. And as he's flying, just hovering over the surface of the water, he looks down and he sees his friends. And so he tries to get down to his friends. And so he 
flies into the surface of the water and gets smacked back and tries it again and can't break through that surface tension. Keeps trying until he's exhausted. He wants to tell them what a wonderful new world he is in. But he can't get back to them. And so exhausted, he rests and then realizes in his resting that it's OK that he can't get back. Because one day, each one of his friends will discover what he has discovered, that this is not the end, but the opening to a whole new world. Friends, the best we can do is enjoy this world that we've been given, to live in responsibly, and to trust in faith the words of our confession, that in life and in death, we belong to God. And to remember that that God that we belong to is good all the time. Amen.